a good time. An important implementation aspect is the sequence number field. So when we covered the sliding window protocol, we said that the sequence number field should be greater than or equal to SWS plus RWS. This was needed to ensure that the receiver does not confuse between two different packets which happen to have the same sequence number because you are reusing the sequence number space. At that time, this SWS RWS is dictated by the bandwidth delay product. So this is roughly two times the bandwidth delay product. But after flow control, the maximum value this can take is two times the advertised maximum advertised window size. Because even if the BDP is greater than the advertised window size, the sender will not send more data. It is limited by the advertised window size. Given that in TCP, the sequence number field is 32 bits and the advertised window field is 26, we are indeed ensuring that the sequence number field far exceeds twice the maximum advertised window size. So that's good. But then when we were covering the sliding window protocol, we assume that packets get delivered in order. In other words, if you put one, two, three in the pipe, they will reach the other end at the, in the same order, one, two, three. If you put two, one, three, they will also receive in the order two, one, three. Whatever order you put the packets in, it's the same order the receiver is going to receive. Whereas when you are dealing with sliding window at the transport layer, because you are using a best effort service model, this assumption is no more valid. Given this, you really need to ensure at the receiver that it doesn't confuse two different packets with the same sequence number as same. So thankfully, the packets do not live in the internet forever. There is a maximum segment lifetime. We, we normally assume this equal to 120 seconds. Given this, what do you need to do to ensure that there is no confusion at the receiver? Well, basically you need to ensure that this sequence number space doesn't wrap around within this 120 seconds. Now, what is this a function of? That is how fast are these sequence numbers incremented? What dictates that? Well, how fast the data is being transmitted? Well, this is a function of the link bandwidth, the available bandwidth. Now, let's just assume that there is no cross traffic and you are able to achieve this bandwidth. So here are the different link types. And this is the bandwidth that you can achieve on this particular link type. Now, tell me for this fast Ethernet 100 Mbps link, when there is no cross traffic, what is the time it will take for the sequence number space to wrap around? So this is what it boils down to 100 megabits you are sending in one second and you are incrementing the sequence number space for every byte and you have 2 to the power of 32 bytes for the sequence number space to wrap around. So how much time does it take to send these many bytes? So if you do the calculation, this turns out to be 5.7 minutes. So this time for wrap around is again shown for variety of these links. So if you remember, the maximum SL is 2 minutes. So once you start hitting gigabits per second, the sequence number space is no more adequate because the wraparound happens very fast within 3.4 seconds. So how can you solve this? You need to increase the sequence number space. That is, you need to allocate more number of bits for the sequence number. That would mean coming up with a new version of TCP, which they didn't want. So what instead they did was to use an option field. So TCP had this 32 bit timestamp option field where the sender timestamps a packet before sending. Why such a field arose, we will see shortly. But for now, assume that such a field exists. So what is done is each segment now has a 64 bit identifier where the lower order bits come from the sequence number field and the higher order bits come from the timestamp field. So that's how TCP handles sequence number wraparound. We were talking about the timestamp option available as part of the TCP headers. Why did this arise? The earlier implementations used to measure round trip time at a clock granularity of 500 milliseconds. This is because the timer implementation on those systems did not provide any better resolution. 
So what this resulted in is if your round trip time is just 50 milliseconds, it was still measured as 500 milliseconds. And if it was 400 milliseconds, it is still measured as 500 milliseconds. The timeout is a function of the round trip time. So it was also turning out to be a multiple of 500 milliseconds. So if a packet was lost, this resulted in inefficiency because you are slow to react to the loss. So to overcome this, the time stamping option was introduced as part of the options field of the TCP header. So you can specify a 32 bit timestamp. So what happens here is that the sender, when it is sending this particular segment, actually reads the actual system clock. By the way, in the earlier systems, reading the system clock was not the problem. It was the software implementation of the timer that was problematic. So anyway, when the sender sent the segment with the actual time, the receiver, all it did was once it received the segment, when it is acknowledging the segment, it just copied the timestamp it received as part of the segment back in the acknowledgement. Given this, how do you measure round trip time at the sender? Does the sender need to maintain any state? No state maintenance is needed here because once you get the ACK, you note down the system time, let's say that is equal to T1 and the ACK itself is going to carry the timestamp T0. So the round trip time is equal to T1 minus T0. The state you need, you actually put it as part of the segment which went all the way to the receiver and came back. And this time stamping as we saw earlier also helps in handling the sequence number wraparound. There is another implementation aspect that we need to take care of that is keeping the pipe full. Suppose a flow has a bandwidth delay product of let's say 100 kilobytes. But your advertised window field is only 16 bits. What this means is that the maximum you can advertise is limited by this amount, which is 2 to the power of 16. That is roughly around 65 kilobytes. Given that your CWND, which is capturing this, can hit 100 kilobytes, and your advertised window is restricted by this, what is the maximum amount of data that the sender can send without waiting for an acknowledgement? Well, it is minimum of these two values, so this dictates that. So even though you have more available bandwidth as dictated by this, you still were not able to utilize it because you are limited by these 16 bits field. Notice that in this particular case, the constraint is not really the maximum receiver buffer. These days, the receivers can very well allocate order of megabytes per connection. Even if a receiver allocated one megabyte for this particular connection, you can still send only 65 kilobytes because your advertised window field is limited by 16 bits. Now, if you're wondering, do such huge BDPs arise in practice? What if the reality is that your CWND is always going to be less than this particular value? Well, let's check it out. So here are the various link types and the bandwidth associated with them. Let's assume that the round trip time is 100 milliseconds. So what would be the bandwidth delay product if you have a available bandwidth of 10 megabits per second? Well, just multiply this with the round trip time. This yields 125 kilobytes, which is more than this value. That is 65 kilobytes. With the cross continent, you will definitely hit this round trip time and 10 megabits per second is quite feasible over those links which typically run in gigabits per second. So at least on some of the links, the bandwidth delay products can very well exceed the 65 kilobyte limit. So what is the solution? We already saw this before. This is the window scaling option. Again, this goes as part of the options field of the TCP header. Basically, you specify a scaling factor. For example, if you specify a value of 3 as part of the options, this is saying that you should multiply the advertised field, the advertised window field by this value to get the correct advertised window. That way, you can work with very large bandwidth delay products, which as you can see, arise when you are using gigabit per second and a relatively large round trip time. There is in fact lot more to TCP than what we have covered so far. 
I can easily do an entire course based on TCP. But we have covered more or less the basic concepts. So with this, we will wrap up TCP. So to summarize, in this video, we saw how TCP implements flow control. We put everything together, both the flow and the congestion control in the context of the sliding window protocol. We also looked at a few other miscellaneous implementation details. This concludes TCP and hooray the transport layer as well.